Good morning. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. On this third Sunday of Lent, our focus is on Jesus' third word on the cross this morning. Woman, here is your son, here is your mother. So the theme for the entire service is the righteousness of God gives relief. We begin then with him 578, chief of sinners though I be, 578. And this serves as our confession and our reminder of forgiveness this morning. We continue our worship on page 207 in the front part of our hymnal, Morning Prayer, page 207, and we invite the congregation to arise. <clears throat> o Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Hasten to save me. God, O oh Lord, come quickly to help me. Christ destroyed the devil's power. Praise and thanks to God. Oh, come, let us sing to the make
Our first scripture reading this morning is taken from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 42, beginning with verse 14. And there's words of judgment, of course, in, in this reading on those who practice idolatry, worshiping idols instead of the one true God. But there's also a message of amazing grace. The word used is the word law, but sometimes in the Bible, in the Old Testament, the word law can stand for all of scripture. Sometimes it even refers to the gospel, the good news. Here, it stands for the gospel. So note God's amazing grace about his righteousness that gives us relief. I have been silent for a long time. I have kept still. I have remained or restrained myself, but now, like a woman giving birth, I will scream. I will gasp and pant. I will dry up mountains and hills. I will make all their grass wither. I will turn rivers into islands. I will dry up pools. I will lead the blind on a way that they do not know, along paths they do not know. I will direct the things I will accomplish for them. I will not abandon them. They will, they will be turned back and completely disgraced. Those who trust in an idol, those who say to molten images, you are our gods, you deaf ones, listen. You blind ones, watch carefully so that you can see who is as blind as my servant, who is as deaf as my messenger whom I sent, who is as blind as my associate, as blind as the servant of the Lord. You, Israel, see many things but you do not observe. Israel opens his ears, but he does not hear. Because of his own righteousness, the Lord was pleased to make his law great and glorious. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We invite the congregation to please take out the Psalter books in front of you and turn to page 775, that's where we find Psalm 143b, page 775.
Our second reading is taken from Paul's letter to God's people in Ephesus, chapter 5, beginning with verse 8. And here we're encouraged to treasure the righteousness and the relief from our Lord. It moves us to walk as children of light. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And do not participate in fruitless deeds of darkness. Instead, expose them. For it is shameful even to mention the things that are done by people in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For it is light that makes things visible. Therefore, it is said, Awake, sleeper! Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. So we invite John Winnicky to come forward and share with us the Passion History according to Matthew, chapter 26, verses 57 to 75. Jesus' first trial in the Sanhedrin. Those who had arrested Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, yeah, the high priest where the experts in the law and the elders were assembled. Peter was following them from a distance and went as far as the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see how it would turn out. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they could put him to death. They found none, even though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. The high priest stood up and said to him, have you no answer? What is this that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus remained silent. Then the high priest said to him, I place you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, it, it, is, it is as you have said, but I tell you, soon you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? See, you have just heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They answered, He is deserving of death. Then they spit in his face and punched him. Some slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Christ. Who hit you? Peter denies Jesus, which is also recorded in Mark, Luke, and John. Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him and said, You were also with Jesus at Galilean. But he denied it in front of everyone, saying, I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about. When Peter went out to the entryway, someone else saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, Peter denied it with an oath and said, I do not know the man. After a little while, those who stood by came and said to Peter, Surely you were also one of them, because even your accent gives you away. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know the man. Just then the rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly.
Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I, the Lord, will not forget you. See, I have graven you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. Isaiah 49, verses 15 and 16. God's word on which we wish to ponder this morning, Jesus, Jesus, uh, <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Lord. <laughs> God's word as it's found in John chapter 19, beginning with verse 25, Jesus' third word on the cross. We invite you to read along. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. This is the word of our great God. In Christ Jesus, the perfect lamb and our only savior, my dear friends. How do you handle a person who is having a bad mood? <clears throat> do you know people like a young lady I know? This is her attitude. Don't talk to me until I've had my coffee. Or how about this one? Do you know anybody like this? I'm in a very bad mood. So nobody better mess with me today, boy. How do you deal with a person like that? Be interesting if you have some thoughts to share on that particular question. I believe such a person needs to wipe off the dust off his, off his or her Bible and read it. There's power there. There's comfort there. There's wonderful promises there. There's help to focus on our one true God whose love for us is as high as the heavens. And when we know Jesus as our Savior, we have enough reason right there to put into practice. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 and following. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, which is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Dear friends, we all know, if anyone has a right to be in a bad mood and not want anyone to mess with them, it would be the Lord Jesus. Just think, we all know that, right? No matter how difficult life may be for us, no matter how badly we may be hurting, no matter how difficult the circumstances might be that surround us, nothing compares to what Jesus is going through here on this cross because he loves you and he loves me. Focusing on that Savior then, as we have our hearts touched when he takes care of his mother here in, in the words before us, let's all be encouraged through these words, your son, your mother. Note Jesus' perfect love. Note he purifies our love. Doesn't it blow you away, dear friends? By this time, he's been hanging on the cross for hours, and the scriptures are silent. He's fulfilling those words like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like the shearer, the lamb before the shearer is silent, he doesn't open his mouth. The scriptures are silent about any crying out in pain, any groaning or moaning. And soon, according to John's gospel, the end will come. So we marvel that the first words from his lips, as we reviewed in the hymn we just sang, Father, forgive them. They know not, do not know what they are doing. Love for his enemies. Incredible. And as we reviewed last week, heart for the repentant thief, the great comfort. Today, you will be with me in paradise. And now, how heart-touching. 
he sees his mother and the disciple whom he loves, that's the Apostle John, who never uses his name in the gospel he wrote, only refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He sees them standing there, but note all of whom are standing there. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Just think, my friends. These people are heroes of faith. Just think, where are the rest of the disciples at this moment? You all know. They're up in the upper room with the doors locked, the windows locked, trembling in fright that they're going to be next. So these folks are heroes of faith. They're exposing themselves to possible danger. They're exposing themselves to possible ridicule. Everyone else except the voice of the thief is ridiculing Jesus. They who stand there could be ridiculed as well. You know, Jesus had been reminding his mother about the proper relationship. No, we're not to pray to her. No, we're not to elevate her to equality with Jesus. She is a hero of faith, yes. But already when Jesus was 12 years old, he reminds her of their proper relationship. Remember how Joseph and Mary had searched for Jesus for three days when he was 12 years old and they had journeyed the 70 miles from Nazareth to observe the Passover together there in Jerusalem. And she said to Jesus, We've been, why did you do this? We've been searching for you for three days. And Jesus is surprised. Remember his answer? Didn't you know? I have to be about my father's business. So he's gently reminding Joseph, he's not going to be continuing to be the perfect carpenter's assistant. And he's reminding his mother, she's not going to have forever a perfect helper in the kitchen. Their relationship will change when, his, when he seizes the mission that he came to accomplish. And Mary does recognize this soon after the angel announces the miraculous birth. She praises God in her song in Luke chapter 1. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. She knows she's a sinner too. And she needs a Savior as we all do. And then later on in Jesus' ministry, we're told actually in three different Gospels, that was recorded that Mary and Jesus' brothers are outside. They want to talk to Jesus, but the house is full and they can't get to him. So Jesus gets the message. Your mother and your brothers are outside wanting to talk to you. This was his response. He replied, my mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. So Mary's just like you and me just like people who love the Lord, who believe in him, and put that faith into practice. It's not just thoughts, it's not just words. It's a living faith in the living Lord. Jesus says, you and I, dear friends, are his mother and brothers. Isn't that something, how, how he wants to be close to us? He wants us to know how much he loves us? <clears throat> and of course, can you imagine being Mary? Can you imagine standing at the foot of the cross? This is the child you bore. If those of you blessed with children were like me, I couldn't hardly take it. Well, it wasn't that bad, but when our children were having their baby teeth having to come out and make room for their permanent teeth, I wish I could have knocked my teeth out so they didn't have to have that pain and bleed that blood. But of course, that didn't work. So to tell you the truth, I can't imagine, I can't imagine being in Mary's shoes and seeing her son so badly battered and bruised. We heard it again. It started already in the Sanhedrin. The people who are supposed to love God and love their neighbor as their self, treating Jesus so despicably, not just the despicable words, but their despicable deeds. So we can just imagine, though, how as Mary stands there, perhaps she's going way back to when Jesus was 40 days old 
Remember, they went to the temple to take care of the proper sacrifices and all. And there's the elderly, devout man of God, Simeon, who without a word takes that baby Jesus in his arms and praises God. He's seen his salvation. God kept his promise. He doesn't know exactly how this is going to pan out, but he knows this is the child that is the promised Messiah. Praises God, and then he says to Mary, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. And my friends, if Mary was also thinking of the words of the angel when the angel first announced this miraculous birth, perhaps that sword was piercing all the deeper. Remember what the angel said? He that is her child will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. She doesn't know the rest of the story like you and I do. So how she must have wondered, how is this going to fulfill those special words of the angel with her son suffering and dying? God's son suffering and dying. So in his pain and misery, how awesome, when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved, standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. Think of it, my friends. He's not thinking of himself once more. He's thinking of his mother. Who's going to take care of her? You know what it was like for a widow in those days. They would become, usually, become beggars. So you might be thinking, well, where's Joseph? Well, since we don't hear of him again, since the incident there in the temple of Jerusalem, we assume, as the Bible scholars assume as well, that he's already passed away by this point. So where's Jesus' brothers? There again, we assume they were in the congregation that day in Nazareth when the whole community rejected Jesus as their Messiah, and he had to leave his hometown, his home congregation, and make Capernaum his adopted home. So Jesus is here providing for his mother. He's putting into practice the fourth commandment. This is how it's recorded in Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving to you. Perhaps you learned it as I did. Thou shalt honor thy father and thy mother that it may go well with thee and thou mayest live long on the earth. A wonderful promise, the only commandment to which God attaches a special promise to live long on the earth. Jesus was here fulfilling the fourth commandment, keeping it perfectly along with every commandment, even loving his enemies as we already reviewed. So here's your son, your mother providing for his mother. Know Jesus' perfect love, how it touches our hearts, that he cares about her still, even though it's a different relationship now. Note, he purifies our love. My friends, he gives his mother to we, what we might call his closest disciple. Always John is with him. And to this disciple, he says, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. He adopted Mary as his mother. He was the instrument God used, Jesus used, so she wouldn't have to be a beggar, so she would be taken care of. She'd have a roof over her head. She'd be provided for. My friends, this reminds us, of course, of our moms and dads. How did we do with the fourth commandment? Were you like me? I didn't always do what they asked me to do. Did you do like me? Sometimes say no. Clear rebellion there, by the way. Those two little words, two letters in that little word. There's rebellion. There's a little idol. My will, not yours, right? It's like 
any sheep who goes astray. I want what I want, not what you want, Lord. Bowing down to the idol we see in the mirror, huh? So did you get disciplined like I did and learn there's consequences to sin? Yeah. Didn't feel very good at the time, did it? Looking back, we can say, thank you, Lord, because you and I have been around the block. We see what happens when parents don't discipline their children. Often they end up in jail. The importance of a loving parent who disciplines us. Were they perfect? No. Were you and I perfect, those of us who had children? No. There's only one perfect parent, and that's our Heavenly Father. So hopefully we learn from our parents to be better parents, huh? And hopefully we're still thanking God for them because you see what happens when there is no parent. I asked Charlie Isles, a former pastor of this congregation, who's now visiting the correctional facilities, having Bible studies with the inmates there. And he talked about a facility up in up in uh, Fond du Lac, where it's all young people. Gave a presentation about his work there. I asked him, afterwards, I asked him, Charlie, did those young people have fathers? No, Paul, not a one. It's clear. They didn't have a father there to do. This is not pointing fingers at single moms, my friends. They need our prayers. They need our help and support. But what a difference also in my life to have a father. What a difference to have parents who put into practice their love. Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent, is careful to discipline him. So we learn Sin is serious. Do we remember that when a child defies a parent and sins, it's also a sin against God? Yes, against a parent or anybody in authority. When we disrespect, when we disobey, it's a sin in God's eyes too, making us worthy not just of a short life here, according to the words of the fourth commandment, but an eternity in hell along with it. Praise God, dear friends, to have a righteous God whose law is great and glorious. The righteousness of God is his forgiving love that spurs us on to want to live a righteous life. And the righteous will live by faith. That's why Jesus hung on that cross, to live the fact of God's righteousness so we could stand righteous in God's eyes. No, as we reviewed last week in our reading from Romans, it's not by the law, it's not by our deeds, but by the perfect work of our perfect Savior. And yes, the righteousness of God gives relief. What a comfort to know Jesus stayed on that cross till all our sins are forgiven. His blood washes us clean. And then his perfect life is ours by faith as well so that when our holy God looks at us, he does not only see the slate washed clean, he sees the perfect righteousness of the Lord Jesus. We stand holy in his eyes. So our God, for Jesus' sake, will remember our sins no more. So if our parents wronged us, my friends, or anybody for that matter, we're to remember those sins no more. That's forgiveness. How we treasure God's righteousness. That Jesus would pay the price and wipe our sins out of his memory. So at the foot of the cross, we can have the strength to do the same. And we need prayers for parents. Look what it says the last couple verses of the Old Testament in Malachi chapter 4. And he, that's John the Baptist, shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come 
and smite the earth with a curse. Underscores what we have learned, right? The family is the foundation of the nation. So parents need our prayers. Move them to put faith and love into practice. Start right at home. Turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. Don't think work's more important. Don't think drinking's more important. Don't think drugs and partying is more important. Family. You know, God's first, then family, then work. Huh? Turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, not just for their physical needs, for their spiritual needs as well. And of course, it has to be the other way around as well. Grant that the children will have their hearts turned to their fathers. Pay attention, listen, learn, put it into practice. Don't just let the word of God or, or the model lifestyle go in one ear and out the other, lest they become blind and deaf, just like God's people in Isaiah's day. So my friends, do we struggle with a bad mood? Might we be there to help somebody struggling with a bad mood? We can remind ourselves and others, go to the foot of the cross. Stand in awe of that Savior who is there to forgive us all our sins when we fail to stay in the word. This powerful tool to help us and heal us and encourage us and remind us we have a loving Heavenly Father who wouldn't even spare his own son. How will he not along with him freely give us all things? How will he not carry us through challenging circumstances and times. Go to the foot of the cross for the assurance we have a perfect Savior. And our love that so often is lacking is cleansed so that in God's eyes it is perfect. Go to the foot of the cross to be strengthened so that we can have a heart that honors our moms and dads to put into practice, even if they're in heaven, to put into practice the good things they taught us and honor God in the process. Stay at the foot of the cross to find relief. There's God's righteousness that moved him to sacrifice his son so you and I could be righteous. From that time on, this disciple took Mary into his home. So just as John, took care of Mary, Jesus' earthly mother. Our God takes care of us, not just for a lifetime, but for an eternity. Your son, your mother. Note Jesus' perfect love. Note with great joy and relief, he purifies our love. Amen. And the peace of God, which is beyond our dream, shall guard and keep our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We invite the congregation to turn to page 210, where we find the Te Deum is the Latin word. In English, we praise you, O God, page 210, and we invite you then to arise. And let's sing this wonderful confession of faith.
Congregation may be seated. Heavenly Father, you are the source of life, wisdom, and all good things. Look with favor on all mothers who have given life to their children and nurture them with loving concern and faithful instruction. May their children honor them and call them blessed. When they become weary, sustain them with physical and spiritual rest. Gracious Lord, according to your will and promise, you sent your Son into the world to atone for sin and restore eternal life. You planned his path to the cross, and he followed it perfectly. Your Spirit led him to endure the temptations of Satan, but he triumphed. Your own people rejected his message, but he persevered. He confronted the blindness of unbelief, the confusion of doubt, and the hurt of death, but was not deterred as he proclaimed your kingdom to the least, the last, and the lost. Guide us to follow Jesus by faith as we walk the road of temptation and trial. Spare us from falling into Satan's traps and strengthen our resolve as his partners confront us. Teach us to use your word as a weapon to fight against all devilish lies and deceptions. Use it, Lord, to strengthen us, heal us, and help us. When we fall, and we surely do, lift us up again with your forgiveness, the relief found in your righteousness and grace. When we struggle with bad moods, bless us through the scriptures, for that's how, how Jesus helps us, our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, our everlasting Father, our Prince of Peace. Grant us your Holy Spirit this Lenten season that our faith in our Savior grows, that we may rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. We pray this in Jesus' name, in whose name we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. We conclude then by singing hymn 518, Christ Be My Leader.